In case you didn't know this, you should stop consuming protein powder ASAP. Protein has to get broken down by the digestive tract into small absorbable amino acids. Any excess protein actually gets spit into the lymph and contributes to accumulation in the lymphatic system. This excess protein has to leave the body somehow and the kidneys end up overburdened. If you notice that your urine is foamy, this is a clear sign that there is way too much excess protein floating around your body. The body does not need half its weight in grams of protein like most people believe. Around 60 grams of protein that we can get on a plant-based diet daily is totally enough. If you feel depleted when you take out protein from your diet, it means you're not getting enough amino acids from greens. Greens, greens, greens are the answer. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What was the lymph thing that she was talking yeah, about? That Extra was just, protein floats around in your lymph? That was what pretty the? crazy talk, I think. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, that's just fraudulently wrong. That's basically, I'm not even sure where that came from, but that, this is not a concern. <laughs> Okay, there's something about kidneys too. That's a probably like a more commonly argued thing, I guess. But uh, if you have healthy kidneys, they should be fine in any normal circumstance, right? Correct, correct. Now, now there is a little bit of truth there in that when you deaminate amino acids, you do convert that into ammonia, urea. You do excrete some of the nitrogen in your urine, but none of that is really concerning when it comes to protein. You're basically not going to injure yourself. So there's like a little bit of nugget of truth. So do you increase your risk of osteoporosis when you eat a low protein diet for decades? Yes, absolutely. Low protein diets are a major risk factor for sarcopenia and osteopenia, and that is a huge problem. And so this is dangerous advice. You can survive on protein this low, but it's not good for optimal health. And this is terrible. So what about the advice that, uh, you know, if you need more protein, you should eat greens, greens, greens. I mean, that sounds nuts to me. What are you saying? Leafy greens like uh, lettuce uh, is actually fairly high in protein per set of calories. Percent, yeah, but absolute number, no, right? So there is protein. It is a high percentage. The absolute amount is horribly low and no one's getting enough protein from greens. So is it even possible? Okay, if, if your goal is only 60 grams, I guess maybe you could get there. I don't think that you could get enough protein to survive just from leafy greens, for example. Cows are pulling this off mostly because they're eating the microbes that are breaking down the cellulose in grass. And so your cow is actually a microbivore. But they also eat like all day, every day, kind of. That's what right. you have to do then if you're going to live on grass, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. But of course, you, you can go on a plant-based diet. I think that's uh, perfectly fine. But you, you would need uh, probably more protein than what she was talking about. And you would probably need it from other sources, right? Like beans, lentils, soy protein, tofu, seitan, or just protein supplementation. Any successful vegetarian or vegan with really good body composition is using some form of concentrated plant protein in some way. And if you look at something like tofu, this is technically a protein supplement. This is a concentrated form of protein from soybeans. So what's your take on uh, on people on a plant-based diet if they do take uh, care to get enough protein, which might be quite a lot more than 60 grams? Plant-based diet is completely possible if you go out of your way to increase the protein percentage and the absolute protein amount using some sort of concentrated protein product. I would still recommend a gram per pound of ideal body weight. And uh, I would recommend that someone get a lot of this protein from a legume source, which is going to be better, more complete, more bioavailable. And if you're really, really, really trying to build as much muscle as possible, you might want to go a little bit higher, 25% uh, higher on the absolute amount. Most of my vegans and vegetarians, if they're not supplementing, they tend to be low on iron, low on zinc, maybe not getting enough omega-3. So if you do a little bit of supplementation, then you're totally fine. It's great. I have some super healthy vegetarian and vegan bodybuilder patients who are in amazing shape and is super healthy and doing fine, but they are using concentrated forms of protein. They're prioritizing the heck out of protein. As long as you're really smart and go out of your way, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Let's uh, look at another one. Probably getting too much protein, but I want to get shred. Sh shred? You mean shredded? I'm not quite sure, actually. <laughs> protein, it's everywhere. It's a critical part of our bodies. It's in almost every food other than maybe fruits. Do you need to take a supplement? You definitely do not need to take a supplement. Have a wide variety of foods on your plate. You need 0.8 grams per kilo 
That's the recommended daily allowance. That means about 55 or 60 grams if you're a 150 pound man, 45 to 50 if you're 150 pound woman. What if you're working out hard and you really do want to get shredded? You can double it, maybe up to even 100 grams if you need it. And this is the high upper limit of protein requirements. If you take too much protein in, you're going to damage your kidneys, you could damage your liver, and you end up just peeing it out or storing it as fat. So just eat real food. Uh, okay, uh, maximum 100, that's the top. I think I've had twice that for years. I'm a little sad anytime a full-size adult human is eating under 100 grams of protein a day. <laughs> yeah, so this yeah. is really terrible advice. It's, it's absolutely disturbing. And then uh, what they say is the, the recommended daily allowance is 0.8. That's not even true, right? That's the minimum, not the recommendation. Right. This is the absolute minimum to not be horribly deficient and have a disease state from pure deficiency of protein. So if they stand there and say that 0.8 is what you should be aiming for, that means that half of the people would be below the recommended absolute minimum. So they're going to be perhaps harming some people then. This is absolutely terrible advice to conflate the bare minimum to not die with what you should be aiming for is disastrously terrible. I don't know what kind of medical people these people are, but this is terrible advice. Completely. I agree. Here's what I eat in a day on a low protein diet as a girl who weight lifts. For breakfast, I'm having half of a large watermelon. For lunch, I had 11 champagne mangoes and they were so delicious. For a snack, I ate this entire container of cantaloupe and I also had a shot of wild blueberry juice. For dinner, I'm having four sweet potatoes, a huge salad, and some asparagus and mushrooms. The truth is, my diet isn't a low protein diet. Everyone else's diet is just overly saturated with too much protein. I'm getting the perfect amount of protein I need from fruits and vegetables. Like and follow for more. She seemed fit, but uh, that seemed very low protein. That is very low. The one thing I like about this is it highlights the fact that the most important factor for muscle retention is resistance training. And if you give your body a strong enough stimulus that it absolutely has to have some muscle or it's going to die, your body will scavenge every amino acid and prioritize it or triage it into muscle. But would this person have even more muscle and better strength and better gains and better PRs in the gym with a higher protein amounts absolutely there's no way they wouldn't again this is possible but not optimal and thank god this person's doing heavy resistance training because otherwise they would be just as sarcopenic as your other fruititarians which uh, have notoriously low muscle and strength and bone mass the resistance training part bravo love it awesome still just barely getting by and far from optimal with this low protein diet. I just don't understand it. And it's also probably a question of how long you do it. If you do it for a week or a month or two months, it might be not too bad. But the longer you do it, the bigger the risk that you're going to end up really, really low on lean muscle mass, right? Absolutely. And this person's very young. They have very little anabolic resistance, tons of anabolic hormones. They're at their peak of their entire life for anabolism and muscle building and anabolic hormone milieu. And as they get older, they're going to get more anabolic resistance, lower androgens and all these sorts of things. Yeah. So anybody who's listening who's a bit older, watch out. I'm a dietitian that talks about eating low protein all over the internet. And this is like the most compelling argument I can think of. So in addition to all the research we have, in addition to being able to observe the world's longest living people, we can observe our own body. The entire reason that we think animal protein is better than plant-based protein is all because of these amino acid studies that were done back in the early 1900s on rats. That is when we classified proteins as class A being animal proteins better and class B being plant proteins worse. And this happened because rats need a lot of protein. Like rat breast milk has 10 times the amount of protein as human. So drum roll for the most compelling argument. Human breast milk is 6% protein. During the first six months of life, humans double in size. Theoretically, that should be all the protein we need. Well, uh, <laughs> Yeah, 6% protein in, in breast milk. You know, that's designed to make babies grow a lot, right? Absolutely, yeah. Human infants are supposed to be over fat. I mean, they're supposed to be fat because it's very protective on, for a number of reasons. And they're supposed to grow as rapidly as possible. And so human breast milk is very low protein percentage. It's one of the few foods in nature that is a high carb, high fat. At the same time, it's going to be consumed in higher amounts because it's hedonic. It's going to maximally fat infants, that shouldn't be used as a reason to eat anything in particular, because that's uh, all context dependent. Like there's a stage of life where you want that, you need that, it's critical. I used to think back to my kids when they were well fed, 
they were super chubby. I mean, how many rolls of fat did they have on their arms? Very cute. But I mean, I, I don't think it's great for grown-ups to live on that kind of food. It's definitely uh, some type of fallacy to assume that because human breast milk has a certain composition, that's what people are supposed to eat their whole lives. Yeah. Let's take another one. Doesn't yes. it doesn't give them an upper hand to eat dairy or whey or no, or, no, no, or no. flesh in in any way that eating plant based protein would? The plant based proteins are better. Um, first of all, you get all the essential amino acids you need by far more than enough, even for the for the most vigorous athlete. Nice. Secondly, they don't have the bad stuff that is interfering with you uh, if you eat meat. If you eat meat, along with that protein comes saturated fat which slows blood flow that slows oxygenation that slows it hurts your performance mm -hmm. um, plus cholesterol and that's why people end up with a coach syndrome meaning 10 or 12 years after their football career is, is they retiring then they're starting to have heart disease and all these things from the unclean food they've been eating stop it wow and then it, that seems like some advice from the 80s or something. I don't know. Okay, so Neil has a lot of just plant-based propaganda. And, you know, so even the most vigorous athletes can just eat plants and be fine. Maybe, barely. To refer to, like, you became overweight as a coach when you were a former athlete. And the reason is because your foods are unclean. So there's so many things wrong with that. To have this, like, moral <laughs> flavor to it. Saturated fat is evil. Saturated fat slows your blood flow and lowers your oxygenation. You can, you know, just picture it clogging your arteries, you know, like the bacon fat in your sink drain. And th there's just so much stuff to unpack there. It's hard to know where to start, really. Yeah, this is bad. I'm not a big fan. I'm also fine with people eating plant-based. I think, yeah, for ethical reasons, there are many ethical reasons you could think of to want to do that. But this kind of scaremongering is a bit tired i think and it doesn't seem to be a lot of support for it scientifically like you said saturated fat slows your blood flow it's, it seems very random this is not outcomes data in real people this is basically just mechanistic contrived nonsense and to take a real problem and something people should be worried about and they use it to push your agenda it's just evil so it's like everybody knows what coach syndrome is right you were an athlete and now you're overweight well, let's think about it. Is it because you ate unclean foods because animal foods are a sin and you should just be plant-based? Or is it because you were exercising a ton and now you're not? Or because you're eating foods that have horribly low satiety per calorie to the point that everyone gains weight on them. And the only reason you didn't when you were an athlete is because the huge amount of exercise you were doing that's not sustainable. And so let's talk about the real issues that has everybody on earth just gaining a pound a year and ending up, you know, 50 pounds overweight. So that is an actual problem. And then you use that to push your plant-based agenda because th the reason you end up like that is animals. I mean, you can see with these, all these carnivores these days that you can basically eat 100% animal-based food and you lose weight, you improve your metabolic health. I'm not saying people should necessarily do that, but, you know, it certainly seems to work well for a lot of people. Yeah, sure, you can you can push a plant-based agenda, but I'm also finding it pretty objectionable to just scare people with BS. I'm over the fear-based diet religion crap. I really am. I'm proud of the fact that Hava is not fear-based at all. We're not like, this food's unclean and immoral and a sin and this bad and you should never eat it. And this food's a holy and special and blessed and amazing. We're really just looking at the big picture, like closer or farther to your goals based on society per calorie. It's such a palate cleanser mentally from this fear-based garbage. I'm also feeling very bored with this whole, you know, endless debate. And it never ends. You can just make up any story and then find support for it in one of these 100,000 studies. You can always find someone to support the story you're, you're selling. You know, I read How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, hundreds of scientific references. But then I read the carnivore book, you know, by Saladino hundreds of scientific references yeah. and i'm like oh, okay what's the average person supposed to think well the reality is the fact that you have anecdotes on both sides means that it's got to be a lateral move basically they both work right they're, they're both less bad than the standard american diet which is horrible and that means that you know you can start from a standard american diet you go to carnivore it's better you go to plant-based then it's also better it doesn't really matter 
that much which one you pick. Of course, you might get more quality protein on the carnivore version, but you know, you can always supplement on the plant-based one and, and get the same results. All right, let's move on. Protein is probably the hardest macronutrient for most people to increase in their diet. Many of my clients struggle to get over 100 grams of protein a day in the beginning, but learn quickly that it's not too difficult when you know how. So today I'm going to show you what 100 grams of protein looks like in the real world with real food. Here I've got a pack of two chicken breasts, but one chicken breast, about 100 grams, will give you around 30 grams of protein. Three eggs is around 18 grams, so there's 48 grams already. Next, we've got a can of tuna, which is about 25 grams, and a high-protein yogurt, which is 20 grams. What's that? 93 grams of protein. All the other bits of food over the day will contain small amounts of protein, so you can see it's not that hard to get 100 grams or more on your diet if you know what you're aiming for. And this is with real food that you've got in your cupboards every single day in your fridge. It gets even easier if you add in a protein bar or a protein shake, which do taste very good these days. But why should your protein be high each day? Why aim for 100 grams or more? Think satiety, appetite suppression, recovery, building muscle, and the thermic effect of food. Protein is a high thermic effect of food, which means protein will burn more calories than carbs and fat just in the process of eating and digestion. The bottom line is get your protein in every single day. Simple as that. Hope this helps. Yeah, protein every day. Absolutely. Beautiful. I love this video top to bottom. Everything about it was amazing. Um, showing people what these high protein percentage foods are, learning how to glance at a serving of these and know how many grams of protein it is, protein awareness. This is amazing. It's like you, you already have these foods. You just have to go out of your way to prioritize them and eat them. And here's the reasons why you might want to do that. Everything about this was practical, helpful, spot on, brilliant loved it and he said 100 grams of protein for everybody i think that's maybe a bit of a weak spot there your average american is eating under 100 grams of protein per day men women all sizes i mean i'm all in favor of like more than 100 grams sure but i'm, I'm thinking like some people may need even more you're you're right that's just a really rough bar that if everybody could get to that that would be great 100 grams or more for everybody and then uh, a bit more if you're a big person right yeah, absolutely. What uh, what do you take away from these uh, videos? What's your main take? Wow. So you've got so much information out there. Half of it's awesome. Half of it's terrible. Nobody knows what to eat. Like <laughs> there's just, it's just like plant-based versus carnivore, carbs versus fat, protein's good, protein's bad. It's also polarized and also all over the place that your average person just has no clue what to do and just is kind of like, okay, I give up and I'll just eat whatever tastes good. And uh, that's how we got where we're at. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I, I feel the same. I've been in this arena for more than two decades. I'm getting a little bit sick of hearing the same arguments over and over. And I'm, I'm just more and more convinced that the number one thing that would benefit a lot of people is to make it much easier to see through this and then just find what's right for them. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the HOP approach transcends all of this and lets you zoom out and look at the big picture in a much easier way yeah, exactly so you can you can keep eating what you what you enjoy and what you like just tweak it a bit and be guided while you do that and you have an approach that takes less than a minute a day and requires no knowledge whatsoever i think that's pretty cool there's nothing like it that's right what's the number one thing you wish that people took away from this cavalcade of protein advice well that last video the importance of protein body composition you know protein supports your lean mass carbs and fats are there to support your fat mass so you prioritize protein, you get better body composition, you get a higher metabolic rate from the thermic effect of food, you get a much higher satiety per calorie. And the whole goal of eating is to get adequate protein, but controlling the non-protein energy calories from carbs and fats by eating you know, lower energy density versions of those. And so this is just step one of the whole hob approach is prioritizing this protein. And I love that last video. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ted. Uh, this was fun and um, we'll do it again, I guess. Sounds good. 